Ahead on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. On this week's special edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we sit down with the experts from Beringer Ingelheim Vet Medica Incorporated and learn how to identify and eliminate biosecurity risks on your operation. And now, a special edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen with host Kevin Oxner. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Kevin Oxner. Thanks for joining us. This week, we're sitting down with the experts from Beringer Ingelheim Vet Medica Incorporated to talk about building a healthy foundation for your herd by understanding biosecurity risks and learning how to eliminate them. And joining us in the studio today are Dr. Mac Devon, professional services veterinarian with Beringer Ingelheim Vet Medica Incorporated, Dr. Bob Larson, professor of production medicine at Kansas State University, Dr. Craig Payne, an extension veterinarian at the University of Missouri, and Kevin Johnson, associate professor of ranch management at Texas Christian University. Gentlemen, thank you so much for coming to the show today. It's good to be here, Kevin. You know, before we can get into the details of talking about how to build a biosecurity plan, it seems to me that we need to first understand how we define biosecurity. And so I guess, Dr. Larson, maybe let me begin with you. Give us a definition of what is biosecurity. Okay. The way I define biosecurity is it's the set of things we do on a farm or ranch to keep the bacteria, viruses, and parasites that cause disease away from our herd to start with. But it also includes how do we prevent those agents, if they do get on the farm, from causing devastating losses? So how do we minimize their impact or minimize their spread once they're on the farm? So it, it really involves both prevention of ever allowing agents onto the operation and also limiting the damage that they do if they do get there. And Dr. Payne, maybe you could tell us what steps can a person take to begin evaluating the level of risk that I might have on my operation? Sure. Probably the uh, most complicated part of putting together any biosecurity plan is assessing what all the risk may be. And so what I normally recommend for people that are wanting to put the plan uh, together is to develop a biosecurity team. And that may include, of course, the owner and manager of the operation as well as its employees, but we also need to think about bringing in outside help. And one of those would be the herd veterinarian. We may also want to bring in an extension specialist, nutritionist. We may even want to bring in law enforcement to kind of help us assess perimeter security for that operation. And then once we have that team developed, then we can go through the process of trying to figure out what can go wrong in our operation and make us susceptible to having disease introduced or even transmitted within an operation if it's already there. Are there any particular assessment tools available for people to use? There are. Probably the one that I uh, refer to the most, and others may have other material that they could uh, allude to, but um, there was a program put together by the University of Nebraska in conjunction with Iowa State, Kansas State, and uh, this material is available online. We'll help you walk through this process of biosecurity planning, and it can be found at farmandranchbiosecurity.com. So what are the primary components of a sound biosecurity plan? Um, let me use an acronym that I've heard Dr. D. Griffin from the University of Nebraska use before, and, and that acronym is ARITS, with A standing for assess. And, and what we're wanting to assess is, first of all, herd resistance or immunity. Uh, we also want to look at uh, isolation and assess how we're isolating animals before we're introducing them into the herd. Uh, we're also wanting to assess traffic flow or traffic control in our operation, and, and that includes not only how animals and people and equipment are moving on and off our operation, but also how that movement is occurring within the operation. And then finally, we also want to think about and assess sanitation procedures that we may have uh, in the operation or that we need to implement in the operation. Very good. Kevin, Dr. Payne mentioned a whole team of people that should be uh, involved in developing a plan. And I guess I would ask you a specific question. What role do you see the veterinarian playing in this process? Well, it's Im imperative to have your veterinarian there because not only do they know the local problems that you have in your area, they should know and probably know what you have on your particular farm or ranch. And it's, they'll also have a good grip on what's at a state level and a national level, just things that we should be looking out for. And they should have intimate details and knowledge of your operation that should help you set up the assessment and the plan. 
Very good. Well, this is a great beginning of our conversation. I have a number of other questions I want to ask you, but we do have to go to break. Coming up next on this special edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we'll talk about ways to identify and eliminate biosecurity risks on your operation. Stay with us. We'll be right back. In that ring, buyers have an eye out for healthy, verified calves. Range Ready puts a document in hand, like a medical file for each animal, that lets buyers know what they're getting, and most importantly, what they're not. So go on thinking your word carries all the weight, but in the sale barn, your proof is on this paper. Go on now, take care of your cattle, and they'll take care of you. Everything's heating up at your John Deere dealer during the Green Fever sales event. Stop in and get 0% financing for up to 60 months on genuine John Deere compact tractors, utility tractors, and hay tools. So don't miss out. Get to the Green Fever sales event at your John Deere dealer today and grab a hot deal on the quality equipment and reliable performance you deserve. Offer ends January 31st, 2012, subject to approved credit on John Deere financial installment plan. See your participating John Deere dealer for details. Hi everybody, I'm Joey. And I'm Rory. Join us for a ticket to ride right here in the great state of Tennessee. That's right. Join us for the 2012 Cattle Industry Annual Convention and NCBA Trade Show. It's February 1st through the 4th at Opryland in Nashville. It's your chance for industry education, networking, and some fun and great country music from artists like us. You can find out more information at beefusa.org or on Facebook. We can't wait to see you there. Imagine a dirt road full of potholes and a creek bank with some cane poles catching channel cat. Well, I'm a little more country than that. Think of a small town with an old hound laying out front of the courthouse as the old men chew the fat. Well, I'm a little more country than Welcome back to this special edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. We're joined by a panel of experts from Beringer Ingelheim Vet Medica Incorporated to answer questions about biosecurity. Well, let's get right back to it. And I want to pick up, Dr. Devin, right where we left off. So let's assume that I've, I've completed this risk assessment and I've identified a risk in my operation. What are the very next steps I should take? Well, let's, that depends on the nature of the risk, but let's, let's consider that uh, we have a, uh, a risk for, let's say, BVD. So what we do is we set in place controls for the roots of, of, of introduction of that disease. So we look at animal movement in particular, particularly herd additions. Uh, how do we manage those? How do we deal with isolation? Uh, do we keep them quarantined for a period of time? And it's probably a great idea to do some quarantine, particularly for those diseases that we may not see disease manifest in a very short period of time. Uh, we can look at uh, uh, vectors. Some diseases are carried by insect vectors, for instance. Uh, we can look at testing. We can test and identify those diseases for some diseases, uh, what our risk may be. We can look at potential for introduction uh, of a pathogen by food or water. Uh, we can look at our vaccination practices. So there are a number of things that we can look at from a biosecurity standpoint to help us identify those risks. Now, oftentimes producers uh, look on veter their veterinarian as somebody that comes for procedures like mm. pregnancy testing or, or bull testing. Uh, we should look at that as, let's say we have a, an outbreak of disease and we treat it and we contain it, we deal with it, but we need to also at the same time look under that rock and see if there's another rock there that has the source of how that disease was introduced. So going beyond just dealing with the problem is where we begin to really make inroads with biosecurity. Well, you talk about pregnancy testing and breeding soundness exams. Uh, Dr. Larson, I'd ask you, what experience have you had relative to uh, reproductive diseases? Yeah, there's a, there's a number of diseases that can cause some pretty severe reproductive losses in a cow herd. And the way we biosecure our rancher farm so that we keep those diseases away is, is really critical. 
you know, for example, one of the diseases that I frequently work with producers with is bovine viral diarrhea, or BVD. It has a few interesting characteristics so that of the herds that I've worked with that have had devastating, out, or devastating outbreaks, losses, and we really look under that rock and figure out where it came from and what went wrong to allow that to happen, there's really just a handful of things that are, are common in almost all of those situations. One of the ways that we frequently get BVD onto the farm is we bought it. Mm. We bought it in a, an animal we brought onto the farm, a pregnant animal or even an open animal. Um, and we could have avoided that by combining some testing at the time we bought that animal with a quarantine period. So it's two of the things Dr. Devin talked about. So testing and quarantine. We can also minimize the, the losses that occurred in that situation by having a good vaccination program on the herd having good herd immunity so that even though if we make the mistake of allowing it to get on the farm, we can, we can minimize the losses. The other way in ranches that I've been involved with where we've had a BVD outbreak and it gets on the farm and causes some pretty big reproductive losses is fence line contact. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, several of the things, several of the tools that we deal with or use to deal with biosecurity, um, testing, quarantine, vaccination and, and perimeter control are, are real world problems that I've run into with, with farms dealing with BVD for one example. Are there other reproductive diseases we should be concerned about, Dr. Payne? Sure. Um, you know, trichomoniasis is becoming a, a, a problem in Missouri uh, here in the last few years. So I'll kind of walk through some of the ways that uh, I've heard of this disease being introduced onto operations around the state. And it basically boils down to two uh, different ways. Because this is a venerally transmitted disease, uh, it's either purchased, much like BVD is, and we have an infected bull, or even a cow that recently aborted from trichomoniasis that is still carrying this organism. Uh, these provide sources uh, in which it can be introduced into an operation. And at the same time, we may have a neighboring operation that is trick positive, and if the fences are in disrepair, we could have animals crossing back and forth across borders, bringing it in that way. And so when we look how to mitigate that risk, it basically boils down to what Dr. Larson and Dr. Devin have talked about, and that's isolation mm -hmm. and testing and, and make sure that we reduce that uh, fence line or that potential of interaction with neighboring operation animals. Kevin, what, uh, go ahead, did you have a I was going to say Bob? one other thing that I've seen with TRIC is within, within a farm, you talk about perimeter control, a lot of times TRIC will start in one breeding pasture, and That's if good. we can confine it there with the perimeter control of that pasture mm -hmm. and movement of animal control of that pasture, again, we can minimize the losses. Mm -hmm. Yes, we had the problem of letting it get on the farm in the first place, but if at least at that point we can clamp down and, and minimize the losses. so. Yeah. We talk a lot about bringing it in from out, you know, mm -hmm. preventing diseases from coming in from outside, but kind of in the second step is what do we do internally within our farm ranch those, yeah. to limit those losses? That's good. Kevin, what experience have you had in Texas? Well, we have a common respiratory disease, uh, IBR, which is a virus, infectious bovine rhinotracheitis, and we oftentimes think of it just solely as causing respiratory disease. But we have reproductive problems from that also, and especially where we run a lot of stalker cattle and we've got stalker cattle across the fence from cows and maybe these are high risk stalker cattle. We get some IBR from some fence line contact. We can cause abortions. Uh, we can get vaginitis in some of those cows. We can have eye problems. All these things can, can be serious problems and, and we oftentimes don't think of it as that kind of a disease. But where we run a lot of stalker cattle, especially in the winters on wheat pasture and things like this, it can be a real concern. Dr. Payne, what signs should cause me to immediately call my vet? You know, some of our foreign animal diseases, in particular foot and mouth disease, um, they show up as either erosions or ulcers or even vesicles on the muzzle, possibly in the mucosal lining of the mouth or on the tongue. And so if I was to come across the set of cattle that had those type of lesions, mm -hmm. I'd want my veterinarian out there to see what the nature of those lesions are. It may be it's just a disease that's common to North America, but at the same time, it's better to be safe than sorry. Uh, the other times in which I think it's important, and, and most people would realize this, but you know, being that uh, a new disease being introduced onto an operation, the cattle are naive to that disease. We can see a significant increase in death loss or sickness 
And so that, that occurs with foreign animal diseases quite commonly. So we would want a veterinarian to come out to the operation uh, in, in those situations where we do have a high death loss and a high level of sickness that is unexplained. Dr. Larson, it strikes me one of the, the key differences between a cow-calf operator and let's say a, a swine producer, a dairyman, uh, some feedlots is that uh, we're, we're running in big country, we're running with lots of neighbors, there's lots of fence line contact and so forth. Uh, what are the kinds of things that cow-calf producers should keep in mind as they develop a biosecurity plan? I think that's a, a good point. Compared to other livestock operations, cow-calf operations have a very large perimeter. Uh, in some ways, that's a good thing. Uh, a lot of the disease agents that we deal with, it, it really helps to have cattle spread out. Um, we can minimize the, the contact between animals. We can slow down the spread of disease. So in some ways, the fact that cow-calf operations are spread over large areas is, is to our benefit. Where it hurts us is the fact that we have a very large perimeter. Therefore, uh, we, we really have a very difficult time controlling access of our cattle herd to wildlife. Much more of a problem than some of the other livestock operations that we talk about. The other thing is we will oftentimes have basically the same species right across the same fence. And again, you think about a swine operation or a feedlot or a dairy, they're not likely to have cattle or swine just right across the fence. There's going to be a buffer area before you'd run into the same species that's not managed by mm -hmm. me. Whereas in a cow-calf situation, it's very common to have fence line contact with another operation. So they've got another health uh, a level of biosecurity, another health um, um, uh, program that they've implemented. And so that raises some challenges mm -hmm. because of that uh, ability to pass uh, diseases across across fences. Well, it sounds like then communication and cooperation with your neighbors is really important. Kevin, what would you say to that? Well, I think it's very important to remember that a lot of the diseases we deal with are neighborhood diseases. And I think you've got to work with your neighbors and be alert and talk to them and their employees and your employees and everybody have a lot of communication because it always ha helps to have an extra set of eyes on the problem. And I think that neighbors should be even involved in your making your biosecurity plan where everybody's working together, going back and forth, and so that we know what each other's concerns are, we know what to look for, and that we help each other out. It's just imperative. And Dr. Ever Devin, it, it sounds like uh, clearly a biosecurity plan would differ based on the diseases that are prevalent in my particular area, but, but what guidance could you give us about just some of the fundamentals to a sound biosecurity program? Okay, <clears throat> depending on the disease, we'd like to have at least a couple of stops to try to mitigate the effect of that disease. So uh, in some cases, for instance, BVD that we talked about, uh, controlling animal movement, but also testing uh, would be two things that we could do. Uh, if, it were, if we're talking about something like uh, leptospirosis, mm -hmm. which is housed in wild animals to a large degree, uh, then we're looking at the potential for controlling those reservoirs and also controlling exposure to those reservoirs with the livestock. So it's dependent upon the disease. Uh, the veterinarians are trained to know how, to, how those diseases are transmitted, and so they can help guide the producer based on specific diseases or even on common routes of transmission uh, to help stop those gaps. This is a really insightful conversation, and I hate it to interrupt us, but we need to take another quick break. We'll be back with more in-depth discussion on the role biosecurity plays on reproductive health just after this. Stay with us. In that ring, Buyers have an eye out for healthy, verified calves. Range Ready puts a document in hand, like a medical file for each animal, that lets buyers know what they're getting, and most importantly, what they're not. So, go on thinking your word carries all the weight. But in the sale barn, your proof is on this paper. Go on now, take care of your cattle, and they'll take care of you. 
Purina's wind and rain minerals are research tested and field proven to provide balanced mineral nutrition essential for cattle health, growth, and reproduction. They're highly palatable so cattle consume what they need when they need it. And wind and rain mineral special formulation resists the elements so they won't blow out of the feeder and maintain their palatability even if they've been wet. Wind and rain cattle minerals from Purina Mills, building better cattle. I am an NCBA member. I am an NCBA member. I'm an NCBA member because NCBA provides a uniform voice for all segments of the industry. I am an NCBA member. I'm an NCBA member because it's important that all cattle producers band together to get our message across to protect our livelihoods and make ranching sustainable for the next generation. I am an NCBA member. I am an NCBA member because especially in today's political climate it is important that we have one unified voice and pasture to plate and NCBA gives us that opportunity. I am an NCBA member. Join me today. Welcome back to NCBA's Cattleman to Cattleman. We're spending some time talking with the experts from Beringer Ingelheim Vet Medica Incorporated about biosecurity, a very important issue for all cattlemen. Well, gentlemen, let's take a couple of minutes talking about introducing new cattle into the herd. And, and Dr. Larson, I'll start with you. What are some thoughts relative to quarantining cattle when we purchase and bring new cattle into our herd? One of the things that we should do is whenever we bring new cattle into the herd, commonly replacement heifers or bulls that are coming onto the herd, but, but also if we buy some pregnant cows or really anybody we bring onto the farm, we're concerned about diseases that might uh, pass pretty quickly from those new cattle to our resident herd. So the types of diseases where um, if there's going to be a problem, it's going to be pretty soon. So we need a quarantine long enough to really get through that time period. And, and it's hard to say exactly what that number should be. Generally, people aim for 30 days to six weeks as a time frame to isolate the cattle that are new away from the resident herd. And, and I should really clarify, that's 30 days or six weeks of those cattle being healthy. Mm. So if those new cattle break with the disease, two weeks into our quarantine, we extend the quarantine time because I want them to completely get over that. I want them to quit shedding whatever virus or bacteria is causing the problem and have time to completely get over that before I expose them to the rest of the herd. That's really important for diseases where it, it is confined in time to a fairly short period of time. But we also have diseases that have basically lifelong carriers. Mm -hmm. and, and several of the diseases that we've talked about like BVD and trichomoniasis, but also anaplasmosis and other diseases, really once you're infected, there's the potential, at least in some of those animals, to be infected for life. Mm -hmm. And so in that case, a six week quarantine isn't gonna solve that problem. Mm -hmm. The good thing is for a lot of those diseases, we also have tests that can identify those carrier animals, because in this case, we're talking about carrier animals that don't appear sick. Mm -hmm. And so what we really talk about with quarantine is it's the perfect time to, yes, quarantine those animals, keep them away from my resident herd, but also do some testing at the beginning. And that might be a blood test. It might be an ear notch test. It might be uh, testing bulls, which is uh, scraping the prep use. Mm -hmm. So, you know, several different ways that we talk about testing. And we can do that at the beginning and, and maybe again in the middle of that quarantine period because we're trying to protect our herd from those diseases that, that might come along very quickly or that might be due to these more long-term carriers. Gotcha. Dr. Devin, what, what would you add? Well, this is, it's also important to think about where we're going to quarantine these cattle, right? Mm -hmm. Do we want to quarantine them in the, in the corrals that we would routinely use to process baby calves two weeks later? That's not a good idea, obviously. <laughs> but we want to quarantine them in such an area that we can confine anything that they may, may leave behind in terms of uh, contagious uh, pathogens perhaps in the, that are shed in the feces, uh, the urine and that sort of thing. So uh, maybe we receive them into a dry lot situation. We hold them for a good length of time. 
The other thing we haven't really talked about, we've been talking about primarily reproductive disease, but when we bring in new cattle, particularly from outside of a geographic area, you know, they may be carrying uh, uh, weed seed. They might be carrying parasites that we don't want to introduce onto the ranch. Hmm. Or at least if we do, we want to confine them to an area where that risk will go away over time. Maybe we get the seeds to sprout and we deal with that or the parasites have time to die mm -hmm. and we treat the animals on arrival. So where we, where we receive them is a pretty important situation. Maybe it's dry lot, maybe it's a trap that we don't use again for 12, 18 months. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're receiving routinely, we're, maybe we're getting a load of cattle a week or something like that, now we've got a plan for contingency to keep the load that came in last week separate from the load that's coming this week because the risk may be different. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things to plan for and, and plan contingencies around. Some things that we often overlook, uh, and clearly. Dr. Payne, I, I guess I'd ask you a question. As we think about where we pasture cattle and what cattle we pasture next to which other cattle, what are some of the recommendations you'd give us in that regard? You know, the, the two groups that I, I feel are most vulnerable on a cow-calf operation would be pregnant cows or groups that have young calves in them. So I'd be very cautious uh, what cattle you put beside, if at all, beside the, those uh, two particular groups. Kevin? Well, we'd really like to keep two fences between groups of cattle, especially stocker cattle and cows, but I don't particularly want another set of cows that I may not be familiar with next to my bred cows. And so it's real important if we can to plan things like our pasture rotations, where we have different rotations where we can keep some space between these cattle. And sometimes we may need to do it between groups on our own ranch. Mm. We also need to, once again, talk to our neighbors, work with them. This may be where you both sit down and talk about your pasture rotation programs, where we can keep some space in between cattle and everything. And, and we generally think of biosecurity about things coming in on us and things like that. But we need to remember also that the problem may start on us and we need to be a good neighbor. Mm -hmm. I don't want that problem starting on me and going to my neighbors. So we need to be cognizant of that. And so when we design new fences, when we design new structures, we need to remember not just maybe to do it because of grazing management, but we need to keep biosecurity in mind mm -hmm. also because this really helps keep those cattle apart sometimes and just think about when we build uh, new structures. Maybe we decide we're going to run cows and calves and we're going to manage our grazing and, the, and what we have with some additional stocker cattle. Mm -hmm. Well, we need to be cognizant that, that when we've got those new facilities that, that we build, may build to handle them, or we may need to have separate facilities on the ranch just to have good sanitation and, and not cross-contaminate something. Do you have anything to add? Sure. You know, one thing I want th people to think about, and, and this comes from experience going through packing plants, as many have, have been through those here in the past, but what I've always found interesting about a packing plant is that on the tours you start out in uh, fabrication and packaging and you wind up finishing the tour at receiving. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is simply because you want to start out in the most sterile environment in, in the packing plant going mm -hmm. to the, the, the most non-sterile environment. Mm -hmm. And so I encourage people to think about as they're processing animals or how to manage cattle flow on their operation that they keep that in their mind. We, we work the cattle that are at lowest risk or the healthiest animals first right. and then we focus on the, 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 those that are sick later on. Another so, great we don't, so we don't vol in, include that cross transmission yeah. of diseases. Real practical tool. Dr. Devin, here in Colorado, there's a number of us that transport cattle to summer pasture or corn stalk pasture, what have you. What kind of considerations should we keep in mind for those of us that do transport cattle um, every year? Well, your risk in transportation is what was hauled in that truck before your cattle were, right? So we want to have clean trailers, clean trucks, uh, and make sure there's not a backhaul involved. You know, a cl classic example, we've had a lot of cattle move out of Texas and go east. Sure. You know, what if we send a load of cows east and and uh, they're in a truck that, that came with high-risk cattle mm -hmm. coming from somewhere else. So we know that, that some of these pathogens can live for an extended period of time in, in manure and urine. And so it's important to have those transport uh, equipment uh, good and clean and sanitized before you start loading particularly pregnant animals on them. Yeah, well, that's some great pragmatic advice here. When we return, we'll talk with our expert panelists about ways to make sure the vaccines you select for your operation have a fighting chance. 
Stay with us. We'll be right back. From Iraq and Afghanistan, our brave warriors are coming home, wounded. Some with wounds you can see, some with wounds you can't see. Wounded Warrior Project was created to support our men and women coming off the battlefield. Please help carry these warriors the rest of the way home. Get involved at woundedwarriorproject.org. Education, networking, opportunity, and fun. That's what you'll find at the 2012 Cattle Industry Annual Convention and NCBA Trade Show in Nashville, Tennessee. Get your ticket to ride with your fellow cattlemen and women in the country music capital of the world. You'll find cutting-edge education, top-of-the-line technology, and entertainment that can't be beat. Don't miss your ticket to ride to the Cattle Industry Annual Convention and Trade Show in Nashville, Tennessee, February 1st through the 4th, 2012. For more information, visit beefusa.org. Hi there, I'm Joey. And I'm Rory, and welcome to our farm outside Nashville, Tennessee. When we go to work, whether it's on tour or here at home, we wear the West. That's right, where it's that perfect snap shirt or that perfect pair of boots. When you wear Roper, you wear the West. Learn more about us, Joey and Rory, and about Roper Western wear at eroper.com. Telling the truth and being real And feeding my family a home-cooked meal That's important to me That's important to me And planting the garden and watching it grow Welcome back. We're spending this hour talking with the experts about biosecurity. Let's pick up the conversation with our friends from Beringer Ingelheim Vet Medica talking a little bit about vaccines. And Dr. Larson, I'd like to start with you. From a biosecurity standpoint, which diseases should we be thinking about vaccinating for? Well, there are a lot of, vac there are a lot of diseases that we don't really have vaccines for. But the good thing is some of the most important reproductive diseases that we've talked about today do have effective vaccines. So when we talk about setting up a vaccine protocol for a herd, we're generally talking about the viral diseases that can cause abortion, such as IBR, infectious bovine rhinotracheitis, and BVD, bovine viral diarrhea. So those two viruses are important because they can cause abortions in cows, and we want a good, a good herd immunity to those, uh, to those viruses. We've also got some bacteria that can cause some reproductive losses, particularly leptospirosis and vibriosis. Those are often combined in, into a, a single vaccine, but those two, va those two bacteria also should be included in a um, reproductive vaccine protocol. Another one that we use sometimes is a disease that we've discussed here, and that's trichomoniasis. Mm. There is a vaccine for that. The vaccine is, would only be used as part of the control program, much like the other diseases we mentioned. So it may or may not be implemented depending on the risk of the herd um, that, that you're working with. So those are a number of the diseases that we have good effective vaccines for and uh, that are really, there's, there's two things we're trying to do with these vaccines. One is just raise the herd immunity to a level where uh, really there's very little chance for an outside pathogen to get a foothold. Mm -hmm. The other thing is we also just talk about that, those individual animals. We want each individual animal to develop a good immune response mm -hmm. so that if they're exposed, they, they can quickly deal with it, maybe not lose that pregnancy, maybe not abort, but be able to deal with that uh, infection in a rapid enough manner that we don't have problems. Dr. Devin, talk to us a little bit about the timing of these vaccines. Yeah, we, we think about, about how rapidly animals might respond, but probably what's more important is that we have our maximum immunity at the time that we have the greatest risk for pregnancy loss. So for instance, if we're talking about leptospirosis, it depends on which lepto we're talking about. Leptohargia bovis is primarily early embryonic death, that pregnancy loss. Uh, so we want to have that immunity early in gestation. The other leptos tend to cause abortion a little bit later. Mm. So uh, we need protection that's going to last us 
enough to go on through the whole time of gestation. If we think about the diseases that are transmitted venereally, trick and vibrio, we want our greatest immunity in breeding season, right? Because that's the only time they're actually gonna be transmitted. IBR and BVD, again, we need to have our greatest immunity at certain particular times in gestation. 40 to 120 days is critical for BVD to prevent persistent infection. Mm -hmm. So realistically, for our reproductive diseases, we should be administering those as close to breeding as we can, but not so close that we don't have time for that animal to mount uh, a, response a response to that vaccine. So typically speaking, we really ought to be putting these reproductive vaccines in 30 days or so before the bulls go out. Mm -hmm. Kevin, tell us how important is it that we actually have these things written down? I mean, is it important to have a written protocol? Yes, it's very important to have a written protocol. Number one, when we're preparing to work cattle, we want to make sure that we've got everything that we've discussed our with our veterinarian on our list to vaccinate for. It also helps us in preparing and getting these vaccines on hand before the cattle working. And then we want to have good records. That helps us in having good records for BQA purposes so that we know what we gave, when we gave, how it was given, and where it was given. It's very important to maintain those records. And Dr. Payne, uh, when vaccines don't work, uh, what's the primary reason for them not working? You know, very seldom do I run into what I would call true vaccine failure, meaning that there's been a, a mistake made in the manufacturing process and the vaccine is rendered ineffective. Mm -hmm. Instead, the two primary times that I see a problem with responding to the vaccine is either one, uh, the animal is not set up to respond to the vaccine. Uh, either they're stressed or they're on a poor nutritional plane or heavily parasitized, so uh, their immune system is weakened so they can't respond to the vaccine. So of course, in a situation like that, uh, as long as we address all those other factors and the animal is set up, they will respond well to that vaccine. Uh, the other times in which I see a vaccine failure occurs when the vaccine itself has been mishandled. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe it's been uh, stored improperly or administered improperly, whatever the case may be. And so what I do to address that is I, I strongly encourage uh, producers to be involved with the Beef Quality Assurance Program. Uh, and, and the program discusses all those aspects of handling those vaccines appropriately, you know, how to administer them, um, you know, how to store them, and so on and so forth, so that we do get the best uh, effect out of that investment that we're going to put into the animal. Dr. Devin, do all vaccines uh, take the same amount of time to, to develop an immune response in animals? It's very dependent upon the animal and not as much upon the vaccine. Hmm. Now, it takes a while for those building blocks to be mobilized and if we administer a vaccine in, in a, the neck of an animal that has to be picked up in the lymph, the fluid that bathes the tissues and taken to the regional lymph node, and there at that regional lymph node are specialized groups of cells that actually begin the immune response. So it takes a while for that process to happen. And then even when those specialized cells uh, recognize and begin to respond with a, with a beginning immune response, then it has to be disseminated to the rest of the body, to the areas where that disease might be introduced. So it takes a little time. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that's critical is to know what type of vaccine you're working with. You know, it takes a couple of doses of kill product where we might, for some pathogens, get, be, able to, be able to get by with one for a modified line. Well, I wanted you to, to, to explain that because I think there's a lot of confusion about the risks and benefits of modified live versus killed virus. So, so, so tell us a little bit about what is the difference between those two? Well, a killed product, we use a lot of antigen mass to stimulate an immune response. And typically, if we're thinking in terms of immune response, we think about primary burst, and anamnestic or booster response, okay? So that primary burst we get with the first dose of a killed, and then we allow that to begin to taper off, we give a second dose, and that really establishes the immunity at a protective level. So the first dose, we get a smaller response that won't last as long. If we give the second dose, now we establish it. With a modified live, it's a little bit different because we're putting a live organism that's been tamed down or attenuated, and that, that organism actually multiplies in that animal's body until that, until that immune system begins and begins to stop that, that multiplication in the body. And then the immune system continues to grow while the number of viruses begin to drop off. So with a kill product, we, we really must follow the reg label recommendations mm -hmm. for two doses. Uh, and for the modified live, we need to read those label directions as to timing and using them safely. Uh, we don't want to give a modified live under conditions that are not specifically spelled out on the label 
always, always, before you begin to use a modified live, particularly in pregnant animals, have a good frank discussion with your veterinarian. Know that you know what's on the label and do it correctly. You mentioned a good frank discussion with your veterinarian. Dr. Payne, I'd ask you, how important is it that we work together with our veterinarians in developing these protocols? Sure. You know, um, as an extension veterinarian, uh, one of the things that I do is travel around Missouri and, and, and do programs for producer groups. And probably one of the more common uh, topics that I talk on is vaccination protocols. But I always begin that program by telling whoever I'm working with that, you know, really they need to sit down with their local veterinarian and develop that vaccination protocol for their particular operation. And that's because that local veterinarian has a far better understanding of the diseases that are uh, common to the area as well as they understand how uh, things occur in the operation or how processes occur. And so that veterinarian, that local veterinarian can make a vaccination protocol that is tailor made for that particular operation. Whereas I, as an outsider, mm -hmm. you know, I don't have that uh, knowledge to do so. Yeah, inside, that's helpful. Yeah. Kevin, you work with a lot, of, a lot of folks down there in Texas. And I guess I'd just ask you, what other thoughts would you offer relative to what we can do to, to make sure our vaccines are most effective? Well, it's, it's absolutely imperative that we give those vaccines a chance to work. And what I mean by that is that, that we put it in an animal that's going to respond, that we put it in a healthy animal that's had good nutrition, uh, a good mineral, micronutrients, things like that. Uh, the animal needs to be hydrated and, and we need to keep the stress down. Stress is a big problem when we're utilizing vaccines and the, how effective the vaccines are. If there's been a really stressful situation right before processing or working that can really lower the effectiveness of the vaccines and we don't want that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. those are all things that we need to consider when we're administering our vaccines and, and to give those vaccines a chance to get us the maximum protection that we need to keep our problems down. Very good. Well, you've given us a lot of great information and some very pra pragmatic tips to follow. Thanks for, so much for, for being with us today. Just ahead, we'll get some final thoughts from our panelists. But first, a few words of wisdom from our good friend, Baxter Black. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Quality matters to me because our local farmers and ranchers entrust us with the marketing of their livestock each and every week. It's their livelihood and how they provide for their families. Also, friends and families in the community eat at our cafe and watch the auction to be connected with the beef industry. I take great pride in knowing that my livestock auction keeps this community strong and provides our consumers with a great image of the beef they eat. I'm very proud of what we will do here today. From California to Florida, NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen covers the beef industry. Each week, join host Kevin Oxner as he interviews industry leaders about the topics that matter most to you. When we think about that impact in our industry, it starts with looking at that picture of beef demand. NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen, a television show by Cattlemen for Cattlemen, Tuesdays at 8.30 p.m. Eastern on RFD-TV or anytime at cattlemantocattlemen.org. Want to stay up to date on beef industry news and the National Cattlemen's Beef Association? Check out the new and improved BeefUSA.org. It's where you can find news on both the Federation of State Beef Councils and the work of NCBA on Capitol Hill. Plus links to some of your favorite NCBA programs like the blog Beltway Beef, the 2012 Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show, and the latest from Kevin Ochsner and NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Join us today at the new and improved BeefUSA.org. I am an NCBA member. I am an NCBA member because NCBA provides me with the eyes and the ears and most importantly a voice on issues that affect me and my operation every day across the country. I am an NCBA member. I am an NCBA member because beef producers feed the world. I am an NCBA member. I am an NCBA member. Join me today. Let's face it. You don't think a lot about your trailer hitch. You use it. 
and forget it. We understand. But at B&W, we think about it. Short nights, the long hauls, never-ending chores, the unthinkable. We think about it all, so you don't have to. B&W. Trusted. Lots of cowmen put a little extra into their calves, hoping it'll bring them another nickel up to sale, like preconditioning, early weaning, or for specialty markets. But how can the buyer trust your claim? Old vaccine bottles or your ratty tally book? Truth is, this little green ear tag will be all you need. That's what IMI Global does, third-party verification. The seal of approval, like the nutrition label on your Twinkie. Did I say Twinkie? IMIGlobal.com. There are some people that I envy. Well, maybe that's too strong. Maybe just covet. Their natural ability to recognize and remember horses. You may be one of those people who can look at a day-old colt one time and pick that sucker out of the string 12 years later. Well, I'm not. I wish I was. But in my travels, I'm often put on strange horses for a couple of days on a trail ride or a long gather, and I make it a point to tie a bag tag in his mane. I know, it looks a little dudish, but it beats waiting till everybody's caught their horses and mine is the only one that's left. At least I can remember people pretty well, but some folks are just the opposite. Is this the horse I think it is? You had him here last year? That rope, I remember, got tangled in his feet. He jumped just like a deer. He pulled the Brandon pot plumb down and hung up in the gate. Tore clean off the hinges. Why it don't hang straight. I'm telling you, I know this horse. He threw you across the fence. The ground crew tried to find a hole and hide in self-defense. He bucked back through the cows and calves and tried to kill Joe's truck. I'd never seen a grill fall off. Old Joe was thunderstruck. He finally stopped to catch his wind. His hide was ringing wet. We tried to slip up next to him, as close as we could get, to try and grab a dragon rein was all that we could hope. But he nearly did a backflip when Jim Bob shook out a rope. I thought that net wire fence would hold. But I sure missed my guess. He climbed it like a Sherman tank and lit out towards the west. The whole corral was tore up bad. Well, we've fixed it back since then, but there's still bite marks on the gate inside the Brandon pen. You sure you wasn't here last year? Performed that tour de force? My gosh, old son. I think you're right. You wasn't even here. Ah, seem like I remember now. Slim rode him here last year. This is Baxter Black from out there. Thanks, Baxter. As we wrap up this terrific hour, I want to get our panel's closing thoughts about managing biosecurity risks and having a sound program in place. So, Kevin, let's begin with you. What are some of your final thoughts? Well, we've all probably worked with producers that have had a problem with reproductive efficiency and seen a big drop off in reproduction. And we know the damage that can do to the cash flow. And for them to remain economically viable, I think it's imperative that they get a plan in place and that they follow that plan and that they be observant and just keep their eyes open all the time. Very good. Dr. Payne, what would you add? I guess what I, the thought I want to leave with everybody is that uh, developing a biosecurity plan is not easy, nor is implementing it and maintaining it. Mm -hmm. But what I will say is that it's one of the most co cost-effective disease prevention programs that we have. And to be truthful, there's no disease prevention program that's going to work without biosecurity measures in place. That's great insight. Dr. Larson? Well, when we think about biosecurity, we all can recognize diseases or operations that we've worked with where they've had, you know, tremendous losses. And, you know, that, that's, that's hard on everyone involved. That's hard on the cattle and that's hard on the, the veterinarians working with them. And, and, you know, the herd doesn't bounce back quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, we've talked about a number of tools today that are very effective, but the way to really think about it is not any one tool by itself, but to put it all together. 
because I don't know which the next risk is going to be. I don't know which disease is likely to be the, the problem in the near future. So my overall biosecurity plan is really to just have a, a system in place mm. where the risk is as low as I can make it, um, given some of the things we talked about that are difficult, but just so that even though we know we're dealing with cows, there's diseases around them, we do move cows around, but regardless of all those things, if, if I can be pretty sure that in the worst situation, my herd can bounce back quickly or not be affected at all, that, that's really what I'm looking for. Yeah. But as you say, it's about systems, not just products. Right. We're not looking at one particular disease. We're trying to protect this herd from a number of potential threats. Great point. Dr. Devin, what would you add? Build a team, be observant, have a plan in place, execute the plan. Pretty simple, isn't it? Gentlemen, thank you so much for all your insight and wisdom today. We really appreciate it. For more information about biosecurity or Beringer Ingelheim Vet Medica Incorporated, just visit our website at cattlemantocattlemen.org. Next week on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we take an in-depth look at the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. We'll get to know some of the NCBA volunteer leadership and learn why they work so hard each and every day to promote the beef industry. Thanks so much for joining us for this week's special edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. We'll see you right back here next week on RFD TV.